don't know if my podcast wife and podcast husband are coming. That's... Yeah, fingers crossed. Okay, so we'll get this started. Um, hello, everyone. I'm Paul Rook, and this is the Mysterious Worlds podcast talk show. Um, as you can see, I'm joined in the studio with Bethan Briggs Miller. Hello, Bethan. Hello. Thank you for having hello. me. Hello. No, no problem. Not at all. Um, so let's start at the beginning. Um, what is it you like to do in the paranormal? And how did you get like started? Well, I like to think of myself as the Giles of the paranormal world. I don't go no. out and do the investigations. I'm more like in the library or behind a book trying to find out yeah. like the, the history, the folklore of the area and make connections with what they find out. So, yeah, I'm very much behind the scenes. Okay, cool. So, yeah, um, so you, you like to do a lot of the research side of it. I'm, I'm very much like that myself. Um, I, I used to go out and about and do the paranormal investigations, um, but I think social media sort of ruined that a little bit. Mm. Um, so I've taken a step back and I tend to do some of the research side of it um, and especially do like these podcasts or vodcasts or whatever they call them now. I don't know. <laughs> vodcasts. <laughs> vodcasts, I don't know. Um, yeah, don't know. <laughs> and just get to talk to um, people like yourself, really, and find out what you got, you know, how you guys got into the paranormal. So It's quite um, nice, the community for the paranormal and folklore. I found it's, there's not really any gatekeeping. I thought there would be, like, these um, mythical, like, you know, elders of the paranormal yeah. who were like oh these young <laughs> ones coming in but no actually everyone's been like super eager that people want to get involved which has been really nice yeah absolutely it is isn't it um so what got you started on this paranormal research path well i have a bit of a show and tell for that hang on Ooh. uh so i think it's a mixture of two things i grew up in a haunted <laughs> house and nice tell you more about that in a minute <laughs> and then <laughs> I uh, went to a charity shop when I was about would have been about 10 or 11 and it was closing down and it specialized in books and in the corner of the charity shop um, on its front was a very dusty book and I just went and happened to pick it up and mm. it was this the folklore of Glamorgan where I I grew mm. up and they never tell you this bit in school. If if you heard about half the horrific, wonderfully gory, macabre things that happen, yeah. history would have been the best lesson ever. So I think that's what got me interested in the sort of like the the outside bits of history in the area. And it sort of stayed with me. I kept buying more books. I've actually now run out of space for my books. <laughs> I'm having to constantly buy new bookcases. Um, and then couple that with um, the house I grew up in, which was a very old um, cottage in Wales, yeah. uh, about 250 years old. And it was in an ironworkers. Um, there was an ironworks nearby, so it would have been the ironworkers cottage. And it was only yeah. two up, two down. And there'd have been about 11 people living in it at one point. And just the high mortality rate of the area with mm. the mines, the the smelting, all sorts going on around us. And then our house had its fair share of ghosts. And there were some that you, you could definitely see were almost like a time slip, like stone tape theory. Like you were just witnessing like perhaps a little glimpse at the past. But yeah. a couple of times there was you almost interacted with them. Whenever we did anything new to the house, there was a lady in a green dress who used to come and visit and you always got the sense that she was checking out what you were doing. Yeah. Because um, my mum and dad were putting it back to how it was because the house was gutted in the 50s. You know, it was, um, they pulled down all the old lovely beams and took out the iron fire, you know, took out all the beautiful features. But mum and yeah, dad... Yeah, blasphemy, that is. Isn't it? Blasphemy, yeah. I mean, <laughs> half the street was these lovely stones and then yeah. one house was pebble dashed, which, oh, breaks your heart. It um, does, not it? But there was, one, there was one entity in the house that wasn't very nice and that was in my room. So I grew up with something that used to um, hit me get into bed with me um, and I'd leave the room for two minutes, come back and everything would be turned upside down. Um, I would get a strange like 
voice on the phone come on and shout if I was in that room. It was always cold. Like, you know, when you walk into a greenhouse and the air feels it's like it hits you like that. Yeah, it's, it's sort of, yeah, the, the atmosphere is really thick. Thick, that's yeah. it. So imagine a yeah. cold version of that. Okay. And they had they had loads of people come out to find out what was wrong with it. And there was it was a small room. It was only about mm. five by eight. Really tiny little box room. I just had my TV. I was an only child, so I had my bedroom and a little TV room. Yeah. With all my videos. And yeah, they, they had a huge radiator in there. I could never find out why it was so cold in there. And really I there was a grinning face that used to appear just in the middle of the room and okay. above your head it would just you turn around and this grinning face would be there and i think my parents didn't disbelieve me but i think there was an element of oh she's been watching those scary films again absolutely you know, yeah <laughs> every saturday night down blockbusters yeah do you remember that <laughs> and, absolutely. Um, good old know, days <laughs> it was really cool at 15 if you got away with like renting out in 18 do you remember it was like yeah, yeah. yeah. so they probably thought oh she's been watching too many of those but years later, this is after I moved out. So I'm now living down in Essex and yeah. had a phone call off mum and dad. And it turned out that my mum had just had a knee operation. And when I, I moved out, they sort of turned that room into like a little spare room. Yeah. And she couldn't stick, sleep in next to dad because he kept moving into her knee. So she said, oh, cramped. I'm going to go and sleep in the spare room because you're getting on my nerves. So she was in there and she was reading a book. And she put bent over to put the book down mm -hmm. and turned out the light. And as she turned out the light, the room went like almost like, you know, 70s horror film, the breath in the air and yeah. the shivering. And she said something crawled up the wall and then crawled across the ceiling, landed on the end of her bed. She felt the weight go down and it, yeah. it crawled up to her face and said, get out. And she wow. did on a broken leg. And I then, think I would. <laughs> I think we all would. And I, I was, it was probably that grinning face thing. It felt old and it didn't feel like the rest of the things in the house. I I don't like how these days it's quite trendy to jump to demon. Yeah, yeah. No, I, I totally agree with that. I, uh, yeah, I don't it's, like that. It's sensationalism, but I don't know quite yeah. how else to describe it. I think it's more. it was more elemental. Okay ancient like patient and because yeah. i was a very boring teenager i wasn't rebellious at all i think it was probably <laughs> bored stiff because you know you hear about they like, feed off like teenage angst well i was very boring i it's were like oh yeah. god she's watching lord of the rings for the 60th time <laughs> <laughs> i, I think I, i've experienced something a bit similar to that we was oh. at rye gatehouse um and i i can't see or hear spirit or anything like that myself um but in the basement level and the stairs coming up to the main gatehouse level, yeah. um, there was a spirit there. Um, my medium that was with us, a very good friend of mine, and I trust her completely. She said that it wasn't a spirit of a person as you would think a person mm. would be. It's almost like this spirit has been here so long that it's forgotten how to be a human. Well, that makes sense, yeah. And that's, it's sort of like a feral human, for one of a better I like word. that, a feral spirit. It's sort of yeah. lost its humanity. Yeah. Um, and that, that sort of had the same effect on that particular area. So, oh, I like that. Yeah. That, that does sound, sound familiar. <laughs> well, they, um, they asked their local priest to come and bless the house and didn't, didn't tell him what happened because they thought, God, we're going to sound absolutely nuts. Yeah. So they, they just said, can you just come and bless the house? And he went around all the rooms, did the usual just blessing, got to that room. And he said, oh, you didn't tell me about this room. There's something different in here. And he said, I need you to go downstairs and stay downstairs. And he was in there for 45 minutes and it turned into a full exorcism, apparently. Wow. He was quite that, ill. That, that would have been, yeah, that would have been really impressive to see. Yeah, I know they like to I do know. that stuff in secret, though, don't they? <laughs> they do. Well, mum and dad didn't tell me about it straight away. When we we went up to visit, and I went into that room because there was a little sink in there, and I went to the loo mm. upstairs and went into that room, and I was always a bit nervous about going into that room because there was a mirror on the wall, and I always used to think, oh, I'm going to see it. I'm going to see it in the mirror. Yeah. And I was startled. It felt different. It was warm, and it was like there was 
it had changed. And I hadn't, I didn't know at this point that they'd had an exorcism. So yeah. I went downstairs and was like, that's really weird. Have you finally found out why that room is so cold? And then they said, oh, interesting. You should say that. Mm. So, so whatever it was worked. Whatever it was worked. And we'd, we'd yeah. even met like previous owners of the house and they said, oh, how are you getting on with that back room? So <laughs> we weren't the only ones. Yeah. Did they tell you about it before you moved in, though? No. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, they probably just want that would have made me want to buy it more though i'm that type of like oh wow it's haunted yeah, yeah. okay well that's I'll... it it's just, just put it down to a bit of character and, and moving yeah. anyway <laughs> so yeah oh, i suppose like the mixture of that and just the local folklore i was bound to end up doing something <laughs> like mm. this absolutely um was it obviously you, you got that book um was it the folklore of your area where you where you was Yes, yes, it was Glamorgan. Okay. okay. Um, what, what's um, is there any particular favourite folklore that you liked, or actually delved deeper into it? Yeah, it's going to sound really like quite gory, but I really like death omens. Okay. Like, especially in Wales, I'm I'm giving a talk actually, hopefully at the next ASAP uh, conference about how the high mortality rates of areas that have places like mining or as i said the um, ironworks mm -hmm. um, how death being an everyday occurrence changed the folklore of the area it sort of reflected it like bit yeah. chicken and egg what came first but a lot of folklore that i know about is about looking for signs of death so and it it can come in all different ways so there's um the Kahirith, which is an audible warning, which comes in on the waves and that's sort of like his impending shipwrecks. Mm -hmm. And there's quite a few places that has a smell, like the Morpha Pit colliery disaster had a smell in it in the weeks leading up to the disaster from a death flower. Okay. And there's also like these feelings. So it's, it's very centred on the senses in Wales. Mm. And like most places in Britain, actually the world, the, the old black dog makes an appearance. The black shark, yeah. The shark, um, yeah. Now, yeah, now I, I live in Essex, so I've gone to Shuckland. Absolutely. I've, I've been to um, Bungie. Is it Bungie? Oh, yeah. I'm the, the church. There soon. Did, yeah, you see I the, there. Um, did you see the claw marks in the door? Um, yes, yes, I did. Yeah, I'll see those. Yeah, that's a fab story, um, isn't it? I, I think, if you remember rightly, they've actually got it inside the church. Yeah. So you, you you have to go inside the church now. We we had a little you know look around some churches. We went we visited a few churches there. There's um, some great folklore in the churches around here. I mean, uh, oh, absolutely. Borley gets all the notoriety in Essex, but I'm probably going to be. This is like sacrilegious now. I think it's boring, boring Borley. I don't I don't understand. <laughs> I know Harry Price got involved, but I don't mm. understand how how it gets the. Uh, the sort of the sort of following it does because there's I, other I think churches it's, around that have got uh, far more. Yeah, I th I think you know there's um, with Borley, you you're not able to go up to the rectory anymore because it is just ruins and it's in yeah. private. It's on private land, mm. um, so you're not allowed to go there. Um, it's a small village. The people don't like ghost hunters going up there. No, they really don't, do they? No. <laughs> Um, I, I was actually lucky enough to work with the villagers and do a couple of tours around mm. Borley. Um, and looking into the place, the, the actual church isn't the same location as it is now. It was over no, it's changed, in, the, it? in the next field, I think it was. Mm. Um, so, you know, I've, I've done a bit of investigation work there. Um, but, you know. Well, if you come down like... this way again, I'll have to take you. There's Runwell, where a priest yeah. melted. Uh, there's Langenhoe, where um, the priest was um, embraced by a naked woman and was chased out of the... Um... <laughs> there's one bit where it says uh, he felt uh, the organ and it was warm to the touch, and I had a bit of a giggle about that because, you know, some... <laughs> you got... <laughs> I got a very childish sense of humour. There, there's but... quite a few. I, I mean, I, I um, came from Basildon, so it's oh. not too far away. Um there's a few churches in Basildon, or just outside right. Basildon, um, that are quite prolific, haunting wise. We did um, look at one in our monk episode with Eerie Essex. Oh, there's right. a monk okay. that um, 
appears in a field and then will walk across the road and so many people have been run off the road because they're trying to avoid this monk yeah and then it'll go to the south side of the church which makes people think that maybe if it's buried there yeah. there's something a bit amiss because the south side was saved for unconsecrated burials Canu canudan is a good location oh, as well canudan is my favorite place I've, I've done tours around that as well <laughs> have you did you go on halloween have you run around it um i i have no no they they um avoid that the people avoid going there at halloween I yeah the they, police the actually block the roads into it yeah, yeah, <laughs> which exactly. makes me want to go even more I, I think one night i went up there the the winds were like 60 miles an hour and we was meeting people up there to do a tour and um as we approached from from the east i think it was um a tree had blown across the road that is so quite actually, yeah we had to stop get out Put, like, grab the tree, push that back as far as we could so we could carry on going. <laughs> we well, got we're a hoping few people... to go there soon. Yeah, uh, we've been invited a, by really the good. current coven. Ooh. I know. That'd be interesting. Mm. Yeah. I, I've actually, again, I've also actually investigated inside the church. Yeah. That, anything? That was, um, we did, someone sent a picture to me. Um, I was sitting in the bit where, the choir boys sat mm. and there was like a golden cloud sitting next to me. There's quite a yeah. lot of clouds in Canudan. There was a yeah. golden cloud in the field nearby um, in the field that's supposed to be, it's called the witch's field. Yeah. yeah. How interesting. Yeah, like it, it was is. inside the church. That's interesting. It, this, that, that one was inside the church. Yeah. Mm. And um, I know obviously it's got links to the cunning man and his coven. George Pickinghill. Yeah. That's it, yeah. Um, oh, there's a little village as well um, on the banks of the Thames. Little fish, fishing village. I can't remember off the top of my head what it's called. But there was a witch connected to that little town Denby? as well. Uh, no, there's Chalk Cunning Morale. Um, no, but it's quite a lot of cunning. Chalkwell? So you're saying Essex and witch, nearly every single village. Well, and... yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, they love their witchcraft. Mm. Um, we've got a few people in the chat room, so I want to just shout out to Kelly Elliott, Bride Dorber, and Vivian Powell and Jamie Parker. They're all up there. Hello. Having a listen. If you've got any questions, pop them in the chat room and we'll ask away. Um, yeah, so you're looking at Essex a lot then. Yeah, so I moved down to Essex in 2011. It was a bit of a Gavin and Stacey story I met an Essex lad and moved down here uh, on a whim, really, because um, he was moving up uh, to Cardiff, but we couldn't get a job. And yeah. then I put him for an art gallery that was opening in Colchester, first sight. Never yeah. in a million years thinking I'd get it. And I got it. So like, I was like, Mum, Dad, I'm moving to Essex. That's it. <laughs> Gavin, his face <laughs> is <it> reversed. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so... Um, and it was there I met Elsa, um, my my podcast wife from Erie Essex. And we would spend our days because sometimes it was quite quiet in the gallery. Mm -hmm. And we would, she was just as interested in I was with folklore. And that's how I got to learn about Essex. I didn't want to know the, the history. I wanted to know the folklore and the ghost stories and the supernatural stories. And I've sort of got to know the area through yeah. that being my interest. And we used to just like, nip into each other's gallery and like say have you heard this i got this book and like you know sneak each other books and then it was during lockdown i started listening to weird norfolk which okay. is a podcast about the weird and wonderful in norfolk and i thought oh this is fabulous i wish someone did something like this for essex and i even said that to him i messaged them saying oh i'm i'm really enjoying this this is getting me through lockdown thanks yeah and i said have you ever because sometimes they'll do a couple of stories from suffolk and i said have you ever thought about doing essex and I told them about my interest and they said, well, we haven't really got time to do Essex. Why don't you do it? And then I went away thinking, oh, maybe, yeah. but because I don't like my voice. So I thought, OK, I'll give it a go. And then I was talking to Elsa and I said, do you fancy doing this with me? And within a month, we had released our first episode and we've been going now about a year and a bit. And we just released episode 18. Excellent. Looking at the Hello. devil. Is there any way that we can listen back to other podcasts that you've done? Oh, crumbs, yeah. They're all on 
pretty much every platform, um, iTunes and um, Spotify, Amazon. So just type in Eerie Essex and we'll come up. Excellent. I'm going to have to have a listen to that. <laughs> that sounds uh, good. I've, I've sort of like stuck, uh, I've recently gone back to my Welsh folklore roots as well. I've, um, there's a, a folklorist and storyteller in Wales called Owen Staten. He's mm -hmm. got a fabulous voice. He does um, time between times storytelling on Twitter. So now and again, okay. he'll do a live storytelling and he's got his own podcast where he retells stories and he's got a very Richard Burton sort of voice. Yeah. yeah. And we got chatting because he did one particular story that I knew well and we just got chatting and I and he started listening to Eerie Essex. And then I said, oh, if ever you want to, if ever you need a Welsh voice, female voice for your podcast, let me know. And he said, <laughs> oh, maybe we could do, maybe we could do a little one off. So what has started yeah. as just a one off, we've now got another podcast called Spectre of the Sea, which is um, is part drama, part folklore storytelling. And the premise is that we are taking a boat around the coast of Wales and discovering all the stories. Nice. It's immersive. It's 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 good fun, that one. Excellent. <laughs> that sounds good. I'll have to have a listen to that as well. <laughs> yeah, I've, I've been busy. It's sort of, a lot of this has come from lockdown because I think you had to you had to keep Absolutely. yourself busy, didn't you? So um, yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I I I was working all through lockdown, so I, I didn't have much of a ch chance to deal with any of that. Oh, so um, I was quite lucky because I was on mat leave um, after having yeah. my second child, and then I was working part time, so I had some working from home. So in between. While I was working, I'd be listening to podcasts and I stop and then do a podcast. Yeah, that's it. Yeah, we we done some as well. Got some mm -hmm. podcasts out and yeah. And the daytimes just work. <laughs> working for my yeah. own, but um oh, it's all good fun. Yeah. So um have you have you heard of the children of Warpit? The green yes. children of Warpit. That's I, a I've been there story. as well. You've been to Warpit? I've, I've been to Warpit. They've got a nice little museum there. Um, predominantly mainly about their brickwork because they there's a big factory there that um makes bricks, yes, there um, is, yeah. But that, yeah, they, they had a little section on the, the green children. I think that's um, one of the first folklore stories I heard outside of Wales because I had do you remember the Reader's Digest did these um really cool like one off, it was like different themes and they'd be like fairies and caves and dragons and they were all bound in these lovely sort of covers, yeah. I've I've got a Reader's Digest book, and it's it's quite a big, hefty book. Oh, is um, it? I think I've got it up there. Is it the the coveted folklore of Britain? Um, I don't think. No, I think it was just mysteries, uh, mysteries of the UK or something, or mysteries of the world. Yeah, that's the other one. Everyone like for that one. <laughs> yeah, I, I, my my dad. Had, that's how I got into the paranormal. My dad had it, and every time he went to his bookshelf and see that missing, he's like, "Paul, where is it?" <laughs> I think a lot of people got into folklore from those Reader's Digest books. I think they were actually um, yeah. a folklore podcast with Mark Norman recently did a whole thing on it because it was it was yeah. a starting place for a lot of people who were in our sort of circles. Absolutely. Um, yeah, so I, I just kept stealing the book and reading it before bed. And every nice. time the book went missing, it was with me. Um, but my dad actually gave it to me quite recently and he said, you can have it. And um, I'm like, okay, excellent. So mm. that's where most of my story, like most of my shows came from. Um, it's a good like, starting point, isn't it? It is, absolutely. It's a really good starting point. Um, and yeah, the, the Green Children of Woolpit were in there. So I thought, while I'm in Essex, let's do a road trip to Woolpit, have a look, have a look around. Um, and I've actually come up with a theory of why they, uh, about the Green Children of Woolpit. Go on then. Um, well, during the period they were found, um, in the English vocabulary, they didn't have a word for, bl uh, for blue. No, they didn't, no. No, they called it a shade. It was a shade of green. Mm. So I just think that these children were discovered in the woods cold, and they, were, they had the blue tinge when you go cold. And I just think they were blue, hence the green children of Woolpit. I think I've heard there's a few theories knocking around about why they were that color i think one is there's yeah. a lot of um, flemish immigrants and there was a particular thing they were eating yeah it, 
eaten I've a lot of that. it could cause the um almost like you know sunny d with turning yeah. kids orange it was a similar <laughs> effect and then it just sort of wore off but yeah um, and I, I just, Martin land. yeah I, I just think because they didn't have a word for blue when the kids appeared and they were really cold and they were blue from the cold they just said oh you're you know they're green look at them it's one of those <laughs> mysteries i'd love to know but also i i like the mystery i, I can't yeah. decide if i want to know or not <laughs> <laughs> It's like yeah. if it was a really boring explanation, I'd be like, oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it would would be nice to get a time machine and go back to all these things and um, have a look. Um, yeah. I know another mystery that I, I liked um, was the whole Richard III and where the body was laid to Ooh. rest. And they found him in a car park. Yeah. The car park. Um, and there's actually it's a movie. They dug as well, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah. There's a movie coming out quite mm. soon called The Lost King, and it's about how they discovered the body of Richard III. Oh, some good stuff coming out. Because one of my yep. favourite folklore tales is Jeff the Talking Mongoose. Oh, yes, I know, I know that one as well. It's yeah. fab, and they're making a film of it with Simon Pegg, aren't they? Yes, they are, yeah. I, I heard that one as well. Um, that plays my co-host on the other um, on the other network that I work with. Um because I think we was at a convention in Essex mm -hmm. and she heard about this Jeff the Talking Mongoose and she's like, who would ever investigate a Talking Mongoose? That is just so ridiculous. Who would investigate it? And everyone she asked while she was there was like, yeah, I'd investigate yeah. it. If it comes to me, yeah. If there's a possibility this mongoose is talking, I'm going to be there. <laughs> and some of the stuff it came out with, I'd love Jeff to haunt my house. <laughs> <laughs> when you just yeah. yeah but she's she's never lived that down ever since she, she's <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah you don't disrespect jeff no no respect the mongoose <laughs> respect the mongoose <laughs> no that, that's good um you you mentioned earlier that you you um you do a lot of artwork is, is mm. that paranormal related or just um yeah. something different it's a bit of both, really. Um, I've got my list here because I forget what I'm up to, so I've got to write it down. <laughs> um, yeah, I I do a lot of um, I like I like depicting like the line between civilization and the wild. Mm -hmm. um, so I a lot of woodlands, and I use a lot because I've got EDS, so my hands um, I dislocate a lot, everything, okay. but my hands a lot. So that's why. I, you can hear me cracking every now and again. I've got to put myself back together. Yeah. <laughs> and I was finding that a paintbrush was really hurting and right. it was really making my hands stiff. So I started with alcohol inks, which you can literally just put a load of alcohol on a page, put the ink on, and then you use the dryer to blow it into different to shapes. Blow it across. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I can see that. that yeah. And I love it. And it, it's allowed me to do like really big pieces. Um, yeah. And then I can use bigger brushes to do the trees and everything. And I've had a couple of commissions lately out of it because it's. I think it looks different. Yeah, uh, which is why it's captured people. And I've I've done a painting of black shuck, and I've started doing um, illustrations for magazines. It was recently, you know, Haunted magazine. Yep. Yeah, I know Haunted magazine. A friend of mine, um, Nigel Higgins from um, Out There Paranormal. Yep. He did a really, really good article on um, 611 from Uncanny mm -hmm. with Danny Robbins. And he asked me, I was really, really chuffed when he asked me. I was really quite touched. He said, yeah. Would I illustrate it? And I did. And they had it in the magazine. And then that led on to more things. And I've recently done a front cover for a new magazine in America called High Strange. And that's coming okay. Out yeah. Soon. Yeah. And I've, I've, I've done the front cover for that. And the ASAP conference that I went to recently, which yep. was the, I, oh, I, you have to remember how to say it now. This is anomalous for study for an. I don't know. I, I get stuck with that. It's, it's a mouthful, but there's something about anomal, anomalous phenomena <laughs> the society yeah. in, in that sort of order. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. So let's just go with the ASSAP. <laughs> ASSAP, ASAP. <laughs> Um, so yeah, they had oh, it has amazing speakers. They had um, Peter Laws from Uncanny and 
UFOs, cryptids, they covered everything. And yeah. on the Friday night when we got there, we were quite late and the university is sort of shut down. And I'm full of good ideas, but I regret it the next day. It's like, let's get some whiskey. And it's only 3 a.m. Let's watch The Exorcist. So we were in this kitchen in these student digs with like the Ghost Club and the SPR and um, all these different people just like chatting away about um, The Exorcist. And uh, Mike Mason was there from um, the Cthulhu games. Uh, we yeah. got chatting and then I sh he someone said, she's an artist show, show me work so i did and then and now I've, I've been commissioned for some cthulhu games so i'm that's well chuffed with that fantastic rang Excellent. my mum like, mum <laughs> <laughs> do, you, do you have your artwork up in like um places where people can go and buy them or yeah well, i'm them opening an etsy shop soon for um prints but i've had a couple of exhibitions got one coming up in october november in wivenhoe where i live it's yeah. um just like 50 minutes down the track from London. And uh, it's with my husband, Jack, and our friends, Elena and Joss. Joss did the music to Eerie Essex. And we all do similar things, sort of like hidden landscapes and trying, like not knowing what we're doing when we start and then finding the landscape. Yeah. And um, so um, we've got our, we're putting on an exhibition, the four of us. So we're quite excited about that. Oh, that'd be brilliant. Do you know where that's going to be yet? Yeah, it's in the old grocery. Uh, so it was well. What it says on the tin, it was the old grocery, <laughs> and now it's uh, now it's an exhibition um, space. Fantastic! Oh, that'd be good. So if there's anyone local, get down there. <laughs> if you go on my social media, it's on there because I'm well excited, like posting everything. Look what we're doing! Fantastic. Um, are you a member of the ASSAP? I am. Yes. Yeah. How did you get involved with that? It was actually through Erie Essex. I was on one of the many paranormal Facebook groups just mm -hmm. scrolling through and I noticed this person was talking about an, uh, something that happened to them in Essex and it was Christian yep. Jensen Roma who's the chairman yep. of I'm ASAP in. and I messaged him saying that's a really cool story and I told him about Erie Essex and he yeah. actually came on and told us the story on there which happened in Beauchamp St Paul which is really good it's yeah. a really creepy story like proper cult sort of <clears> stuff going on there and then he said, oh, you know, come along to see, we've got a lecture on this Thursday. I mean, it's five pound a year for a lecture every week and yeah. really, really good lectures. And then so they started because I've sort of like obviously based in Essex, a couple of things have come my way. And because he knows I like um, Welsh folklore recently, yeah. I um, I don't know how else to put it, but it sounds so big headed. I was one of the experts on um help my house is haunted on sky okay. discovery through asap <laughs> they sort of sent me up there to go and talk about welsh folklore and they're coming down to essex soon so it's opened a lot of doors it's they're, it's really good to be involved with them yeah okay so if anyone does want to get involved with the assap do you know how they go about that that just literally google them when the, the website will come up asap and there's the how to join i think it's 20 pound a year if you want like a proper magazine that comes out every yeah. three months which is what i've gone for but if you just want the digital copy and just want to come along to the um lectures it's five pound a year hmm. and they're really good lectures really good yeah i must admit I've, I've seen a few of the lectures come up um both on social media and in my email um but i've never actually gone to one yet they're good. And another one, I, I volunteer as well for the Folklore Library and Archive with Mark Norman, mm -hmm. who does the Folklore podca podcast. And yeah. there's always um, conferences on there as well, um, which is all, again, it's one of these things that we're not paid to do it. Um, so any support anyone can give. And they're not expensive. I think there's a conference coming up soon or an event, and it's like £5 or £3. Yeah. And like a whole weekend conference is 15 and you've got about... 12 different speakers so it's there's a lot going on i think lockdown has meant that i mean the, the, these conferences i couldn't have got to easily if yeah. they'd have been in person so i'm quite grateful that a lot of them are still online yeah i, I think that's going to be the way forward for a lot of you know organizations yeah. like that or like They're hybrid because it was <clears> nice <throat> going to the one in bath for asap because you get to meet the people and yeah. you get to network and stuff but um it's not always possible there's so many on 
Yeah. That it's nice to be able to just think, oh well, I'll I'll go to that one, but I'll I'll log into that one and mix mm-hmm. and match. So I think if they can like put both on, you know, like I think Conway Hall do it a lot. You can either go in person or you can pay um a smaller yeah. fee and just log into their live feed. Yeah. I mean I, I must admit it is nice. I mean, I've got a friend that does the paranormal uh was it paracon mm. um and it's to do with the haunted antiques paranormal research center oh in yeah Hinkley. um and oh, yeah, it's, it's an amazing place i, I really uh, recommend it well, I, was um, really, I was a bit concerned i think they went they put on um they were trying to summon demons the um I, <laughs> yeah they try all sorts i, I think it's it's just as an entertainment thing, I think, yeah. to get people. But it did sound like the beginning it. of a B horror, you know, a horror movie, a B movie. I was like, you know. it, it did, didn't it? Um, <laughs> I mean, I, I went to some of their um, seances when they first mm. started them, um, and we really didn't get too much activity through them either. To be fair, but did um, you have fun? But yeah, it was entertaining. It, it was a good night out, um, nice and cheap as well. And I think they're trying to do like ghost hunts really dirt cheap for the members of public as well, especially at the moment with the finances, the way it's going at the moment, it's getting ridiculous. Yeah. Um, um, yeah. <laughs> so they're trying to keep it as cheap as possible to pull in the crowds. Um, but I, I've been there quite a few times as just an investigator, and there is some weird stuff going on up there. <laughs> I can imagine. It is. I mean, you know, they don't claim that anything's haunted. So they've got loads of objects that you can just go and work with. Um, and there's a lot of mediums that go up there and say, yeah, I'm drawn to this particular um, statue or box or whatever it is that you happens to have up there. Um, and then they get to work with it. And, you know, you can pick things up, pick objects up, move them about, investigate and work with those individual objects. I think, uh, have you heard of, you know, I see Sedgwick who does fabulous folklore podcast. Yeah. Um, she had a good idea. I think she said it just as a joke, but I was like, do you know what? I'd watch that. Imagine uh, like cash in the attic, but haunted yeah. objects, like going to yeah. people's houses and having a look. <laughs> like, oh, that's, that's a great idea. Someone needs to do that. Yeah. I, I remember, um, uh, Zaffis, John Zaffis, oh, when well, he he done um he done a TV show, The Haunted Collector, I think he called oh, himself. Yes. Um, I it just amused me that everywhere he went, it was like, oh yeah, this 18th century gun is haunted. I better take that away with me. Um, you know, it was never something modern that cost about five p down the market. Oh, no. It was always something that was quite valuable. <laughs> <laughs> oh right, yeah, I can see what you <laughs> Yeah. It's like really? <laughs> really? Yeah. Mm. Um I can I can imagine a modern update version of that. It'd be like, oh you're like your 42 in uh, 42 inch TV's haunted. I better take that with me. Yeah, your, your, your PlayStation PS5 Five. Has got yeah. Something going on there. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> um which uh, yeah, it's, it's just entertainment, isn't it though? That I think. I think that's why just... podcasts have become so popular as well. I mean, it was lockdown was quite lonely. Um, yeah. And it was nice to have, I think we were all used to and didn't realize how we were used to voices, like having a chat in the background. Yeah. That's what started me listening to them. I was listening to Lawmen because they're hilarious. And um, that's how I started listening to Uncanny with um, with Danny and that's yeah. got a really lovely community it, it was just started with a few of us like nerds mm. like talking online with a little on Twitter and then we've now got our own little WhatsApp group and like every few weeks we have a, a Zoom call and it again it just started out with a few of us and yeah. now we've got amazing people coming on to talk to us like uh, Deborah Hyde and Dallas Badder and uh, the Appalachian Folklore Podcast with Aaron Bobeck and mm it's it's really taken off it's become its own little thing now and it's it's i never would have thought the social media would be so good for the paranormal community but yeah yeah i know it, it can be good it, you know it really can that's be, how we got chatting through it. it exactly you know that, <laughs> that's how it works um but I, I do think there are some paranormal groups out there that have a lot of 
what's the word? I'm trying to put it nicely. Um, armchair warriors. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and uh, yes. and I think you know they, they've ruined it for a lot of people. Um, lots of like venomous ones too. Like now and again, you'll see someone posting like a screenshot of like an argument they've had, and it's like, whoa, that that was yeah. quite intense. Exactly, and it has got you know it's got no one nothing to do with anyone on that on that um chat but people still feel the need to share it and it's like really <laughs> you know I, I don't go in for that I just avoid it like the plague <laughs> yeah but no that that's sort of why I got into podcasting because I've I've got a lot of experience myself in investigations mm. um I've got a lot of knowledge and I'm quite happy sharing that and talking to different people and you know growing that knowledge sharing and you know have you ever I... been on an investigation and then felt like you've brought something back with you that's always fascinated me because obviously i'm behind the scenes so i don't go out i've been on my first I, investigation yeah. on saturday um, that's how newbie i am at it i i have yeah i've I've seen like corner of the eye phenomenon occasionally mm. when i've been in the flat on my own um like flickers of light but that normally tends to go away after a couple of days as i said because i don't normally see or hear spirit Mm. anything coming back would just be ignored (laughs) so that so they get bored and uh, (laughs) go away um but it's happened to one of my um co-hosts uh my co-workers um in the team um she claims that she's had um someone behind her in the uh she drives so she says that someone's been sitting behind her kicking the back of her seat that she's been driving Mm -hmm. Um, she's she was saying that because she lives in a caravan, my friend, mm-hmm. and she said that she was sitting there one night, and all of a, ta- a sudden, the table jumped in the front room, just literally jumped like someone had kicked it from underneath. Um, so she done her mediumship bit, and she come up with a name, a shortened down name, something like Ben, or mm. something similar to that. Um, and we actually done an investigation that week at Shrewsbury Prison, I think it was. Right. Um, so I went down the list of all the people that had been um, executed at Shrewsbury, and his name was on it. Right. So um, we we done a little bit of research on that particular person, and we found out there's actually a book written about him. So she got the book and learned about him and um, sort of conversed with him and he he happily went back to Shrewsbury, I should imagine. Um, It was just like, I'm here sort of thing. And I I shame that because she was uh, sensitive to spirit, Mm. he sort of latched onto her. Um, So I've not personally had anything like that. It's always been like corner of the eye that I'd be like, mm, yeah, I don't, don't buy into that really. Um, I'm quite sceptical when it comes to spirits, unless it's unless quite it's like to be a bit sceptical. Yeah, I mean, I, you know, like unless I turn a corner and I see a ghost, like in Ghostbusters, you know, in the library. Mm-hmm. If I see that, then I'm going to believe. <laughs> yeah. Mind you, there'd still yeah. be some if they saw that. They'd be like, "Oh no, 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 no." <laughs> yeah, no. I, I think I'd um, I'd be relatively convinced by that. I don't think I'd need to go get her. <laughs> We've um, Elsa and I have actually found that me more than Elsa, maybe because I'm a bit more of a believer, um, whereas she's a bit more of a skeptic. Mm. Um, we've had, I call them more synchronicities, like coincidences that have happened yeah. that seem <clears> to. Um, happen along the theme that we've done so we each episode is a theme so we don't take a particular place we'll do sort of like poltergeist one episode ufos the next fairies the next we sort of attack it by by theme and we've noticed that every time we've done something i'll have a weird experience that is to do with it Mm. not intentionally i'm not looking out for it so we did um, our episode on ufos and it was just before um, the episode came out. So it's always in the build-up as we're doing the research. Right, yeah. And um, perhaps, you know, perhaps you're just more open to looking out for things. But yeah. we always joke that my house is like the British Skinwalker Ranch because there's always something going on, <laughs> here, like on a flight path for UFOs and things. Yeah. And 
I, I find it very hard to describe the UFO I saw. So if anyone's interested, I did a puppet show of it. Um, okay. It's on Instagram under Riri Essex. And what really got me was I've seen two over this house and they were so blatant. It was just like, you're not even trying to hide whoever you are. Yeah. Like, what are you doing? I even got in contact with the MOD and said, look, um, I'm not saying it's aliens. You might be testing something out, but you need to know you can see it. Yeah. You either need to fly a bit higher or rethink because, you know, I, this big <laughs> copper disc came over my house and it was just like, I couldn't believe no one was around. It was like, did it, what, seriously? <laughs> yeah. I think a lot in... of people are like that when that when they see something they can't explain, especially in the skies. Yeah. And like, did we actually see that? Oh, it was just a plane or something and just dismiss it. Well, I couldn't even, I mean, I was trying to think, you know, because we did a lot of, um, We've only done one UFO episode, but this we're going to be revisiting it so many times because I went into the um, archives, you know, where they've released all the MOD files. And I thought, oh, yeah. I'll just pick a few Essex ones out. I got through 1963 and I haven't even touched the rest of it. I got one month out of, and that was enough for an episode. Yeah. So we're going to have to keep coming back. Oh, and there was, it was brilliant. One of the, one of the uh, files I found was an argument between someone and an official in the MOD. And it ended with them saying, right, this is your last chance to find out what I've discovered. Meet me. And it was in this pub in London. I'll be wearing a red rose and I'll have a black <laughs> trilby on. This is in 1940. Yeah. And, they, I, and I just want to know, did they go? Did the guy go? Did the MOD yeah. meet up with him? It's just, it was, there's some really funny stories in there. I bet there is. I'm going to have to go and have a look. Yeah. yeah. Um, have, you, have you looked into Rendlesham Forest? Rendlesham I haven't, Forest no, because that's Suffolk and that There's enough in Essex keeping us busy because... Yeah, yeah. I do want to look at... I, Rendlesham is interesting. And um, there was a really interesting talk at the ASAP conference um, by Christian mm -hmm. Lander about a UFO incident and um, the Thunderbolt incident. And that was really interesting. But the one that's always got me was that one in Wales on the coast. Mm. Okay. What was it called? Oh, I was just talking about it an hour ago with someone. It was the one where it was about 50 school children saw it and the head teacher had the sense to say... Is that where it landed? Yeah. It landed in a school... Not schoolyard, but the field after yeah. next to it. It was like a cigar shape. And yeah. all the children, he got them all inside and made them draw what they saw. It's probably yeah. like the best recorded um, eyewitness account. Mm -hmm. And loads of people in the village ha had strange people turning up at their door, um, both sort of like your typical men in black and yeah. then like silver, people dressed in silver. It, they were the mad ones with the tinfoil hats. Yeah. Damn it. <laughs> what is the name of that? Of I, that I know the case you're talking about, but I can't remember myself. I'm going to have to Google it. That's going to drive yeah. me absolutely. Is there anybody <laughs> knows who's listening? Can you put it in the chat? They... <laughs> See if you can beat me to it. Let's beat Google. Yeah, go for it. Um, but no, I, I went to Rendlesham um, with a couple of friends. And at the time, I had a slip disc, so I was like on crutches. Oh, and bless they you. Went, we went the wrong way and we ended up on a road that went literally all the way around the outside. Yeah. Rendlesham. It took like three hours to find our way back to the car. And, you know, we got halfway around and my mate's like, are you okay? And I'm like, it doesn't matter if I'm okay because I've still got halfway to go. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the Rendlesham is really interesting. It is. Um, um, it's definitely an eerie place and the, the vibes from that area. It's really strange. Um, but we, when I got to the car park, I sat in the car while the others went off to find mm. the um, UFO statue thing. And um, this car pulled up next to us. So I locked the car door because it was mm. no no one around. So I locked the car's doors and um, rang my mate up and started talking to them. I said, if I go missing, this is why I am last. <laughs> But when the other, no, when the I know others a couple come, of people who've had that happen around there. Well, like a strange yeah, when, car when the others come back, um, they actually got talking to this guy, and he was supposed to be meeting a reporter there that didn't oh, show right. up. And apparently, it turns out he was an ex worker at the military base there. 
and he had a really strange experience with a cryptoid in the forest. Ooh. He described it like almost like a monkey type thing. And it was like a little chimpanzee type height. And it would play around all the cars in the car park. And he'd oh, see something this similar thing. in Essex, you know, in a, like a monkey sort of thing. Yeah. Um, mm. And, you know, that, that's what he was there to talk to this reporter about. But they didn't show up. So um, we was like, okay, so what, what's your name? We'd love to have you on the podcast. And he's like, oh, my name's, I can't remember now, whatever. Um, and we took his details um, to get in contact with him. And ever since then, he's just disappeared. No one, know, no one knows where he is. Oh no one's God. seen him. We've not heard from him. Yeah, totally, really weird that. Yeah. So the, maybe I mean, the, the men in black got uh, him. That's like one of the most interesting things around these cases. Oh, it's Broadhaven, by the way, the one in Wales. Oh, okay, um, yeah. Because there's Todmorden um, in Yorkshire. Mm -hmm. And the amount of intrigue around that yeah the, the actual event itself yeah that was pretty cool it was a really interesting story but it's the amount of involvement with the government and like people yeah. turning up the russians as well that makes you is that's the most and it started with a murder um there was a body found on top of a coal pit and no okay. one could figure out how it how it got up there perfectly and it was covered mm. in this slime and then then there was the ufo and like these cows went missing and then they turned up it was like a very in, yeah, it was an interesting UFO, but it was everything that happened around it that was yeah creepy because people disappeared and like would turn up and threaten people. It was, ooh, yeah. I mean, there's a, a case like that in the US. Um, it's the missing four one one. I don't know if you've ever heard of that. Um, yes, Paul, actually, did, astonishing legends. The podcast, uh, Pilatus, uh, literally polite. Yeah, uh, um, Pilatus. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I've, I've seen the documentary that they done on it, mm. and some of the things in that 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 was so weird. I mean, like this little um, toddler went missing, and he was found like three hundred kilometers away. Yeah, um, he said he was being taken care of, t took care of by a bear. Now, if yeah. it was anything like a cryptid, they they wouldn't have the language. And I think Politus said that um, it might describe something like Bigfoot as a bear. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it, it crosses over so many different boundaries. You know, is it, I mean, are these people just generally going missing because they don't want to be found and having accidents or are they, um, are they being abducted by aliens or, you know, <laughs> being taken away by Bigfoot or, but, you know, in so America, oh, they scare me, the thought of it, because oh, yeah. the sheer size of them. Yeah. I mean, there was really even. Hard to in, in this documentary, they um, there was one hunter that she said she was up in the tree, mm. and apparently across town there was a report of a UFO sighting, and then about an hour later she witnessed what she called like a blur in the forest, and it was like a, a creature running through the forest or swinging through the trees, mm. but it was completely cloaked, and you get that a, a bit like the predator, you know? Yeah. You know, she got see that, see that. Um, so there's there's lots of weird and wacky theories out there for that. Um, I do like the connection, some you know, like between UFOs and fairies. Yeah, I really find that interesting because, I mean, I didn't realize the sheer scale of fae encounters. Mm. And if you look at you know the the um, fairy census with the. Yeah. Um, the fairy sightings folk and like Joe Hickey Hall does an amazing podcast called the modern fairy sightings podcast. Mm -hmm. It's, it's more than UFOs, but I don't think a lot of people like to talk about it because I think of oh. all the, the like supernatural and paranormal things. Yeah. There's still something. If you said you saw a fairy, mm. people wouldn't take you as seriously as if you said a UFO or a ghost. No, I, th I think some of the paranormal stuff, uh, uh, account for some fairy saints. I mean, elementals. Mm. I mean, okay, they're, they're spirit, but I, I personally class them as fairy. Mm. Yeah, fairy. I would too. Yeah. Because, you know, because the, the elements are like earth, wind, and fire, and that's all attributed to fairies, fairy yeah. folk. So, you know, I, I've 
investigated a couple of places, um, Kelvin and Hatch Nuclear Bunker. Yes. For one. And I do believe that the spirit in there, in the medical bay area, mm. is an elemental. I've heard that said before. Yeah, there's something ancient. Yes. There's something not. It's not a ghost. There's something a bit more. No, I mean, I, I've had mediums go in with, with me and they've said, you know, th this uh, this spirit thing isn't good, but it's not bad either. It just is. It, yeah, it just is. Yeah. Um, and every time I've been in there, it's very much inquisitive. It doesn't mm. interact too much with you, but it lets you know it's there. Um, not in a good way or a bad way. It just lets you know it's there. Um mm. And I have caught on camera, or well, one of our team caught it on a, um, an old analog camera, um, a face in the medical screen. And it looks quite oriental, to be fair. But as the camera panned round, it jumped back. Right. So whatever it was, it was almost like, oh, no, they've seen us and, and drew it back. Mm. But you could definitely see the eye and the eyebrow and like nose as well. It, if I tell strange. you an encounter I had with a fae, promise not to laugh. <laughs> no, go on. I might laugh. Uh, no, I know, but you will. I, I, if I'm going to laugh telling it because it sounds okay. so ridiculous. No, go for it. Um, I was, I was cooking in the kitchen, and our kitchen, um, the, the cooker's like in front of you, and then on your right, there's the door to the garden, and I often mm. have it open because you know it gets hot. And yeah. um, there's a really nice view down across the village. And right outside the door, I've got like a little herb garden. Yeah. Because um, it's easy to just, you know, take your hand out, get the herbs, yeah, yeah. Go straight in the pot. And I was cooking one night and I was sort of like, I was in a world of my own. And I started hearing this like scuffling noise. Okay. And I was like, oh, what's that? Is it a cat? And then I started hearing this like grumbling. Like, oh, my God. And I was like, okay, maybe a hedgehog, because they make those noises, don't they? Yeah. <laughs> I, I went outside. I popped my head around this corner, and there was this thing, bold as you like, stood there, and it it looked at me and ran off, swearing, <laughs> <laughs> uh, under its breath. And it had, it had a hat. It was like a, a hat on, and it, it was the shape of a potato. Okay. Like imagine if there was a Mr. Potato Head in your garden and it ran off and you know it didn't have four feet. There's a certain gait to a two legged creature, isn't there? And it yeah, yeah. it ran off down the garden and I was just stood there again, like when I saw the UFO, like that looked like a gnome. <laughs> yeah. And and then ever since I saw it, because it it sounded pissed off that I saw it. I mean it was yeah. like proper angry that I saw it. I even I'm sure I heard it go for fuck's sake. <laughs> <laughs> oh, and ever since then, I had the worst luck. I started having stones airport and throw land on my head in the middle of like sat sat on the sofa watching telly. A stone would hit my head, or okay. like some sweets that weren't anywhere near, like things that I knew were in the house but weren't anywhere near yeah. would suddenly like land on my head, <laughs> hmm. and. Things went missing, not just the usual, like, oh, I put them somewhere. Things went totally missing. And everyone laughs at me. Every, every... <laughs> it was my husband's birthday, and we had a barbecue, and I took the Tesco delivery order in the morning. I know for a fact there were bloody potatoes in this order. Yeah. There was, like, two bags of potatoes. So I was going to make a potato salad. And when it came to cooking them, I couldn't find them anywhere, couldn't find them I even look because sometimes you know you put things in daft places. I even checked yeah. the daft places; they had gone, and everybody was like saying, "What have you done with them, Beth?" And I was like, "It's the it's the bloody no! I swear it, it's it's, yeah. it's dogging my steps." It's taken and them back then, to the end of the garden. <laughs> maybe, yeah. and it disappeared recently. We have uh, someone come in to help in the garden. Um, because it sounds posh to say we have a gardener. He he comes yeah. now and again to like um like help <laughs> us like clear stuff up. And yeah. I asked him to because we had some brambles and nettles um by the front. And I said, Oh, could you, you know, could you uh, clear all that out? And he went for it, bless him. He is such a hard worker, but I forgot to say don't pull up that hawthorn because I'm quite yeah. suspicious about things like that. Um and I was actually asking Icy and Joe and I think um Morgan Daimler, like Mm -hmm. How what 
I need to move this hawthorn. It's going to grow in a place and I need access because now and again, I might have to use a wheelchair because of my condition and I've got the pram. Yeah. And they were giving me all this advice on like how to placate potential fae. And I came back from work and he ripped it up. And I was like, oh, my God, the thing's already pissed off at me. Yeah. It's going gonna, it's gonna to have a field day now. Worse, and yeah. it went. Okay. It, it sort of, but it's followed, it followed me to work. Um, mm. Or it was something different in work. Whatever was in work was a bit nasty, actually, because um, it's. <laughs> I was sat at the front desk and my... Um, coffee cup started moving across the desk and the guy sitting next to me is a total skeptic and he when he watched it and i could see his face like i just watched my coffee cup move from one end of the desk to the other and he was like oh they must be drilling somewhere nearby and i was like yeah whatever you need to make yourself feel better about this with their drilling yeah the, the coffee cup was wet underneath and it's created the air bubble yeah yeah, that yeah. Was that. and it wasn't because i checked i was really like oh, well, what's causing this and then yeah. we had things like apples in the middle of the room and on the floor from another room. Like someone came in saying, because I heard these keys drop on the floor. And we went and had a look. And I was like, well, th there are just some keys in the middle of the floor. And as I wow. bent down and picked them up, I said, who are these? Who, whose keys are these? And someone came running in saying, I've lost my keys. They were, I, I just had them. And they'd appeared in the middle of our room. And then wow. I went to put some keys away. Because um, what my job is, I always describe it as Hagrid, because we're keepers of keys and grounds at this no, uni. Right. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> and I was putting them away, like these keys, in a wooden cupboard. There's nothing in there apart from hooks with keys on. Put my hand in, and I felt this sharp pain go straight in my finger. Pulled my finger yeah. out, and I was covered in blood. And there was a sharp shard of metal, like dagger shaped, Ouch. stuck in my middle finger. And I think everyone was a bit like, creeped out with me that day because they were like she's jinxed and so i had to go yeah. to the security office and they had to try and pull the shard of metal out of my finger the and then fairies we are after you from. yeah <laughs> the, the fairies have got it in for you they, they've, le they've left me alone recently so let's Good. hope that was it yeah maybe they moved on to someone else <laughs> yeah yeah so i said i'm quite boring they're probably like <sighs> <laughs> no no far from it well, unfortunately, we have come to the end of the show. It's only an hour long, this show. No. Oh. oh, no. So we'll have to have you back and learn some more about these fairy folk. Yeah, I've got a list. So. Yeah. Okay, cool. Well, I'll book you in after the show. <laughs> we'll get you on again. <laughs> crack, crack on. Yeah. Thank you for having so, me on. It's been lovely chatting to you. Yeah, it's been really good chatting to you as well. Um, thank you for joining us. And, um, yeah, I'll... After the show, we'll just discuss maybe another date um, before Christmas and we can get you in again. That'd be nice. That'd be fantastic. So thank you for joining me. Thank you, everyone, in the chat room. And I shall see you all again next week. Bye-bye, everybody. <laughs> <laughs>